The U.S. orders its citizens to leave Ukraine as Kyiv prepares for heightened attacks from Russia on Independence Day. And the U.N. Security Council is holding a meeting about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which, of course, has been under Russian control since March. Moscow called for the meeting amid reports of continuing shelling around Europe's largest nuclear station. The U.S. and U.K. said Russia could easily resolve the situation by ending its war in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukraine is also celebrating its Independence Day. But this year, the 24th of August, also marks the six-month anniversary of when Russian troops crossed their border to start a war that had been predicted for a number of months. Ukraine is marking its 31st Independence Day from Russia, exactly six months since its neighbour launched its full-scale invasion of the country. Here's a reminder of what Ukraine looked like before. Russia already occupied Crimea and separatist-controlled parts of the east. Russian forces then attacked from multiple directions but failed to take Kyiv. Its advance in the east also stalled because of fierce Ukrainian resistance. It took months for Russia to capture the entire Luhansk region. Ukraine is still holding on to parts of neighbouring Donetsk. The south, in the south, Russia has captured Kherson and Mariupol. But at what cost? Our Ukraine correspondent James Waterhouse reports. As history has shown, the more Russia tries to pull Ukraine in, the stronger people's sense of identity becomes. On the outskirts of Kyiv, this factory used to make hotel uniforms. Now it's flags, lots of them. These are very dear colors to us. Every Ukrainian feels these colors, and we see them in everything, in the sky, in wheat. We have been making flags every day for the past few months. This gives us pleasure and joy, because our work is useful. Okay, so welcome to the Wednesday meeting. Can everybody be off their laptops for the meeting? Thank you. Another symbol of Ukrainian defiance is here, at the Kyiv Independent, an English-language news site set up weeks before the invasion be published either today or tomorrow. Within days, their online following went from tens of thousands to millions. Its editor describes it as the voice of Ukraine and the world's window into it. We are, of course, all um, very much aware of the sacrifice that it took to, to get us all here to this Independence Day and, um, you know, thousands of people who were killed, both civilians and military. I think it's probably the most important Independence Day that we'll see in our lives. On this day last year, President Zelensky donned his now unfamiliar dark suit, with his military putting on this show of strength. Russia had already started to gather troops on the border, and Ukraine's resilience would soon face the ultimate test. This is the same square today, with rows of captured or destroyed Russian tanks in what is a display of defiance. But how independent is Ukraine, with the Russians now occupying a fifth of this country and it being almost completely reliant on weapons from the West? For one former president who campaigned against Russian influence, sovereignty isn't just about weapons and territory. For me, first of all, the benchmark of independence is the strength of spirit, the power of national spirit. Today I can say with confidence that 42 million Ukrainians speak in one voice, and that allows us to face any enemy, including Russia. This Independence Day poses some difficult realities. Criticisms over why Ukraine didn't act on warnings from the West and the country's continued dependence for help to stay independent. James Waterhouse, BBC News, in Kyiv. The invasion six months ago triggered the largest displacement of people in the world today. A third of Ukraine's population has been uprooted by the war. There are now an estimated six and a half million refugees across Europe. Many have been rehomed here in the UK. Six months on, Ukraine has put up a strong resistance to Russia, but it remains far from victory. This is the current state of play in the country, with Russia controlling Ukrainian territory in the south and in the east. 
The southern front around the occupied city of Kherson is where Ukraine says it's planning a counteroffensive. But Russian troops are dug in there and Ukrainian forces still lack the manpower and the equipment to dislodge the invaders, as our correspondent Quentin Somerville now reports. Once more into the line of fire, and it's just another day for the 59th Brigade of Defying the Odds. This is a sprawling front line. It's over 100 miles long, and it's mostly being fought and held by these men, gun crews. But the positions here haven't moved in months. They're outgunned and outnumbered, but it's been like this from day one. They've grown used to it. They're now in range of Russian firepower, so they move fast, barely a word spoken, almost without thinking. It was this brigade who helped halt the enemy's sweep across the south. Their howitzer is older than most of them. It dates from Soviet times. But it's almost become a part of them. Theirs is a practiced rhythm. A drumbeat of shelling on the enemy eight miles south. Six months on, question is, what's next for Ukraine? Well, it needs a win here. And it says it's planning a counter-offensive here in the south. But with all that foreign military aid and with all that foreign military training, has it been enough to give Ukraine the breakthrough it needs here? The Russians are dug in and will be hard to shift. And the terrain isn't helping, says Major Sehotsky. The unit got it in the neck. The Russians have so much ammunition. They were shelling a lot. As you can see, this terrain is flat. It's hard to move around freely. There is nowhere to hide, really. There's very little cover. He knows what it's like to lose everything and stops to help a teacher stranded by the roadside. Yeah. I teach kids so they can learn about the world, so they can learn about all life's wonderful things. But with such a war, when they forced our people to flee, these kids... I have calls with parents. Sorry, my tears are just pouring. They're dispersed across our entire country. Tetiana and her family join the millions of Ukrainians trying to escape Russian aggression. Even so, though, despite its people being scattered to the four winds, this country has never been more united. For the gun crew, it's the end of another day. Six months on, the defenders' burden gets no lighter. Only last week, a number of their comrades were killed by Russian fire. And tonight's blackout carries with it extra menace. Cities across Ukraine are on alert. Of course, this Independence Day won't go unnoticed by Russia tonight. And the fear here in the south and across the east is that Ukrainian cities will face a special onslaught. It's 31 years since he left the Soviet army. 31 years of Ukrainian independence. Ah, oh, this is Vera. Tonight, he is without his wife, his daughter and grandchildren. They're now in London. His shift isn't over, but there's time to open a window to a world away from here. Hello to you. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to heroes. I wish you a happy Independence Day. And to you. Is it quiet today there? It's war here, every day. Please, be strong. I'm so glad you're somewhere safe. I hope we'll see each other again soon. I wish us a quick victory. For everyone. Bye bye. For Ukrainians, wherever they are, there is no escape from the war. You're not just fighting for Ukraine, you're fighting for your family too. We are fighting not only for our grandchildren, but for kids all over the world. I'm saying this from the heart. 
My family is in a safe place. I didn't need to fight, but children are dying. Of course I know that it's dangerous, but as an officer, I have to be here. This is my sacred duty. This year, like millions of others, they will mark National Day as exiles. Ukraine's parks are empty. Its celebrations have been silenced. It's a muted National Day, but six months into this war, the cause of Ukrainian independence has never rung so far or so loudly. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, in southern Ukraine. Well, we saw there the situation for one Ukrainian family in Quainton's report, but tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees have fled to the UK since the Russian invasion. More than 6.4 million have escaped to Europe so far, and you can see here where they've gone. More than 100,000 are here in the UK under the government's Homes for Ukraine scheme. Poland has taken in more than 10 times that figure, 1.2 million. People in the UK who are hosting refugees receive payments of £350 a month in return for accommodation in their homes for a minimum of six months. The government's refugees minister has said this should double to £700.